Welcome to uh, Static Impact webinars for remote viewing in 2014, everyone, and it's nice to see all of you. Uh, we're getting a little bit of a late start. We have a bit of a calamity here with a bird that decided that it wanted to winter inside my house instead of outside. But anyway, we'll get things fired up here. Uh, normally, we've always reviewed sessions. We have a variety of viewers here, all levels of viewers, different trainers, and with Lynn Buchanan with us, who is a trainer and worked for the Stargate unit for the U.S. Military Intelligence as a remote viewer and had other duties as well. With Lynn on site, he's helping us to learn to report so that even though we've trained with someone else or learned at home through books or CDs or natural abilities, um, we're actually learning to work together and work a few sort of informal projects and get used to how each other records and reports and sketches and what their sessions look like. So it's great. Um, I'm happy to see this for the community, and that's why we do record these. We have all time zones represented here as well, and some people can't come for work or school or family obligations or the middle of the night, even though we do have people here, God love their souls, who are, it is the middle of the night for them right now, that they want to learn and share as a group, and so that's why we have these webinars. This year, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to challenge us a little more. There are things that we can do in remote viewing, such as move commands and cues, and there's theory aspects, and we've made many webinars. We're pushing three years now, and we've had tutorials and guest speakers. But this year, instead of just reviewing sessions, I'm going to put out one target per month, and everybody will have the coordinates and have the opportunity to work a session and send it in. And this first Wednesday, because we meet two different Wednesdays, the second and the fourth Wednesday, this first Wednesday, our target coordinates for the target, which is blind, nobody knows what, what it is, are 140108. And we have viewers already working sessions and sending them to me. I will be looking at those sessions over the next couple of days and retasking those viewers. And the second Wednesday that we meet, which is the fourth Wednesday of the month, we will actually go over sessions and um, look at the retaskings and the feedback and everybody will have an opportunity to stretch and grow and use tools in their tool belt with some prompting and, and encouragement without leading. They still aren't going to know anything about the target, but if they have a perception that they can be retasked on for finer information, that's still an exercise that they wouldn't have had before. And so that's new for us. So that frees up our first meeting of the month, and we're going to have guest speakers. Lynn has agreed to come on board. She's always agreeable to teach, as long as the scheduling isn't a conflict. And so we have the first three of the speaker topics set up with Lynn. Angela Thompson-Smith is waiting to shake out her schedule just a little bit, and she wants to come on board. And last I knew, her topic was going to be working together, different groups, uh, different viewers as one together on projects. So that would be a really fun lecture to listen to. And I'm going to contact some other people. So just keep watching the event calendar and signing up. And I'll try and put out notices when I do get new events. And when you do sign up, if you're new, you automatically get reminders. So that happens. And I'll try and get you into the WebEx address book so that you are included when I do add something, you will get an invitation and know about it. So, um, let's see, is Jan oh, there's Janine. Um, can you hear Janine? I hope you never have a problem. Jean, um, just let me know. Can you hear? I know you're in, but can you hear? I hate to um, leave anybody behind. Okay. 
Oh, good. She can hear. All right. Well, I'm going to switch over to my desktop because that's just easier. And uh, a little strobe light effect as always. And here was my notice that said, I, I have a wild bird in my house. Yes, a wild bird in my house. All right, I can take that down now. Here are, is a PowerPoint that I made up. And Lynn um, and I had just talked about this. And he can jump in the chair and talk without any cues or prompting or whatever. This is what he does. However, I wanted, I had some goals in mind what I would like to see tonight because um, I'd like to come at this from what I expect to see or what I would like to see in a professional remote viewing session, which you are all training toward, you're practicing toward using this in a purposeful way. I don't think there's anybody here who's doing it just for a hobby. Um, I'd like to teach you to not necessarily think like an analyst, but sort of think like an analyst in remote viewing. We're going to talk about some phase two activities and exercises. Anyone who has trained with Lynn's lineage and has the manual in, has phase two exercises included. He used to have them on CR Viewer, but he's crashed a couple of times. I think that maybe after tonight he'll add those back in. But anybody who wants the form, I can send it. Is it, it not to you. on there? No, they're not. I looked because okay. it would have been great to just link them. I'll but have Lynn to put them back on. Yeah, you've had so much trouble with viruses this last year. Probably just didn't make it through. He's had to reassemble his entire website twice. Hate to sound like most. People who have written books, but the uh, exercises are at the back of my book too. That's, I didn't mention that. I should have. All right. So I put this together, and there's also a Word program, that's a, a Word document, and so I can send that to folks if you would find it beneficial in any way. So we're going to touch on phase two exercises, and they are for helping you to broaden your sensory perception, ability to, reporting ability by learning to be a better observer. When you do that with your conscious mind, then your subconscious is also learning and growing as well. And we will address this, but we've made webinars, hours worth of webinars on phase two exercises, and I refuse to do another one. I want to come at this tonight as from the subconscious and what I would like to see. And so I just chose terrain, and which is topology. And there are some similar terms, such as geography and topography. So it's a mix of what, and there's some, I'll just hold, there are definitions. And um, I've got maybe five, hopefully not 10 minutes of things to say, and then I'll be turning it over to Lynn. And uh, he'll see what I've cooked up here in a minute. He, he trusts me just a little too much. So introduction. Here is the scenario. The blind tasking for a remote viewing session includes describing a location for decision-making purposes. Would the new business thrive here or there? Is the lost object here or there? Would crops grow better here or there? What kind of crops would thrive? Various phase two exercises, p 2 it, can increase the observational and reporting skills of the conscious mind, which carries over into the observational and reporting skills of the subconscious mind. A little typo there. These exercises are included with the manual, as I, as I just mentioned. We'll be reviewing them today. As Lynn said, they are in his book, The Seventh Sense, which many of you own and have read, and have been uh, included in several of the webinars that we've done. And you can find those by going through my website, which is Aesthetic Impact. Um, the phase two exercises are conscious mind activity, and those can be done in your spare time. 
Our discussion today will focus on how to use the tools in your RV tool belt to improve your subconscious critical describing skills. I didn't say critical thinking skills, because thinking is in this venue uh, a conscious mind activity. So I changed it up a little bit to critical describing skills or what the expectation of effectively describing terrain or topography in a remote viewing session looks like. A lot of folks will say that uh, when they describe a location, it's hilly or it's flat. Well, there's a lot more to a location than those two words. And to effectively be curious and describe them, you're the viewer, you're in charge of your session. But we don't want, and we'll address checklists, which are not good, but cues were made for the subconscious. And this isn't to get you to start making lists. This is to just give you a mindset of sort of maybe changing up the way you think. And once you learn to report, you just automatically start including those details. All right, terminology, terrain, this is right, and the references are at the end. I just either probably a dictionary online or Webster's. Terrain is used as a general term in physical geography referring to the lay of the land. This is usually expressed in terms of the elevation, slope, and orientation of terrain features. Terrain affects surface water flow and distribution. Over a large area, it can affect weather and climate patterns. And let me jump back in there. Just so you know, those coordinates for that target did not have anything to do with this discussion that we're having today. Okay, some of you, and I know that I just, um, I've been trying to figure out what I wanted to do in 2014, and uh, I didn't give anybody any intro. I just started posting. So, it, I mean, no harm, no foul. It doesn't hurt anything, but you did not need to focus your session on describing location. All right, topology. A topographic study of a given place, especially the history of the place as indicated by its topography. And then an example is Greenland's topology has been shaped by the glaciers of the age, of the ice age. So there's a lot of cultural things regarding a location. And we'll get into that in just a little bit, more than a little bit. The study of the physical features of a specific place or area, usually accompanied by maps or charts showing relationships and elevation and then see geography, which might be a word or term that you're more familiar with. So topography, topology involves the cultural aspects and everything that goes along with that. And topography is a detailed, precise description of the place or region, graphic representation of the surface features of a place or region on a map, indicating their relative positions and elevations. Then geography is the study of the earth and its features of the distribution of life on the earth, including human life and the effects of human activity. The physical characteristics, especially the surface features of an area. Now there are key points regarding the cueing, which again, when Lynn, Lynn swings in here, this is like breathing for him. Key points, which we have gone over many times if you're used to um, being with us on Wednesdays, a well-formed question to a psychic, psychic or neutrally worded cueing, which is subconscious mind, versus questions and checklists, which is conscious mind. There are standard cues that a monitor will use, and we learn that we're at home, most of us, doing sessions alone, so we learn how to be a monitor and a viewer simultaneously. So a CRV standard cue is a verbal statement which is designed to assist the viewer get closer sight contact. The cue does not necessarily need to have any meaning in and of itself and should never be used as a tool to lead the viewer to find any suspected aspects of the site. Phase two neutral wording when used in phase two itself or in the phase two column of the phase four matrix which is you learn that in intermediate for you folks who are new. Deal with cues which will cause the viewer to detect physical aspects of the target. 
they're also, if you're one of Lynn's lineage students, they're essentially the same things that are on your score sheet. And again, this is just a mindset of different, if you know that you never pick up things that like density, you actually try to cue yourself with that in session and see if you can start picking up those perceptions. So that's part of the mindset that I'm trying to instill in you today with thinking about terrain just for this little talk. As such, most all phase two cues involve neutral words about the viewer's own senses and the target site's dimensional qualities. These are actually the cueing words that are in our manual that if you're a monitor and the viewer is stuck, they can, and they're just sitting there staring, a pen's not moving, they're starting to wander off, you can just start down, you say it really fast, colors, luminance, taste, textures, and see if you can get them going again. It's not to lead them, it's just to kind of get them going again. And then in phase four in the matrix, when you're working those columns, again, this is not to create a checklist for you, it's to just kind of jumpstart your head a little bit. So that maybe you start thinking about these things when you're describing in your session. And instead of turning in, you know, sort of the bare basics and little bit of site contact, you'll start going and getting deeper site contact. So um, neutral cues for the subconscious mind, um, generally agreed upon list. They can be used by monitor if and when a viewer is stuck. The dimensional cues of sizes and shapes should not be given until the viewer has already come up with size or shape descriptor. And as Lynn in our manual has them colored differently, so I did here too. My point in using them with you now is to form a beginning learner's mindset of what phase two perceptions are. If you don't have an understanding of what is necessary or expected in reporting, how would you know to report it? And this is an example of exercise five and how to do of the phase to it. And that is um, when you work in phase two, really in viewing, you create a list of descriptors down the left side of the page. When you see the feedback, you see that there's a, what an incomplete list we have made. What if we had a perfect knowledge of the target so we could get all of the descriptors? Wouldn't that be great? Then the list we created would only be limited by our attention to details and our ability to notice what's right in front of us. Well, that's the purpose of this exercise, to increase ability to simply be more attentive. The exercise has two portions. Portion one, you get out a target picture and a blank sheet of paper, and again, you are not remote viewing. At the top of the blank sheet, you write phase two. You turn the target picture so you can see it. Then you list your descriptors, all the while having the picture there to look at. Remember to get descriptors for supposed temperatures, textures, smells, taste, etc. Portion two, when your list of descriptors is as complete as you can make it, find somebody who will look at the list and the picture to check out what you have written. Ask them to point out to you anything you missed. This exercise is a very revealing one in that it points up to you things which you were looking straight at and missed. Because of this, it causes you to be more attentive next time. Don't worry, the next time you will miss something else and then having had it pointed out to you, you will become even more aware. As many times as you practice this exercise, you will probably never get so attentive that you will see everything, but you will become more attentive. The good thing is that this exercise isn't only for CRV, but improves your attention span for the other aspects of your life as well. The following pictures have many similarities. Their locations are nowhere near each other. In a moment, we will discuss how to develop the tools in your RV tool belt using the neutrally worded cues to explore a target. And again, it's more like thinking, like if I were describing this, you know, what is important or more than flat and hilly. Discussing the tools are meant to increase your comfort zone, not to create ritualistic or crutch-like dependence by asking questions by using checklists. Let's clarify so you can learn how to get the most out of your RV session. 
asking questions using checklists is a conscious mind activity. To use lists or templates in session encourages bad habits and can actually limit the subconscious mind because if it isn't on the list, then it must not be important, so I won't say anything about that. And you don't report things that your subconscious is actually getting in session, so you don't want to do that. There are many, many aspects that can be key elements of a given location. Some locations are exciting with distinguishing landmarks. Some locations are boring and everything looks the same. Then there are some of us who view um, sand dunes for eight or nine hours and wrestle with them. That's just a, a really old Lynn story. He actually did that. And he learned a lot. He castle built for nine hours and all it was was a bunch of sand dunes. But if it's a real location, you need to describe the sand dunes. Not everything is going to be an exciting hot air balloon festival with lots of colors and activity and excitement. Cultural descriptors can be specific to regions and as such key indicators when describing a location, which is topology. Your phase two sensory perceptions might be the valuable key key element that, that helps determine a location. Lynn, you're on. As a remote viewer, what are some of the perceptions you might list describing the terrain and of any other topology specific information when you see these pictures? Might a remote viewing analyst or project manager be looking for anything specific? So I do have, a, you don't have to answer it directly. I have four pictures I'm just going to show folks. And then I have the Word document, which I just sat last night and grabbed pictures off the net. And uh, we can talk about them, not talk about them. But I think that um, when you start mixing in whatever you wanted to teach us tonight with some of the pictures, it will just give you something to work with, more or less. All right, here's a picture. And, uh, gee, I tried in my PowerPoint programs that I got to make notes at the bottom, but I see they didn't show up. So this is actually uh, cranberry harvesting in Massachusetts. There, if you zoom in and enlarge this photo, you're going to see that this actually, if you can see my cursor, there's a rake stuck up there. It's wide, and it's got these big spines on it. And there are several people here. They're in water, obviously. There are trees in the background. And if you enlarge this photo, which actually I could do that, not to the point you can probably appreciate it, but there are a lot of little red round things that they're working with, and they're in Massachusetts. Now, the next picture, uh oh, a little quick happy here. Here's another a lone gentleman. There's a lot of uh, steep looking terrain in the background, a lot of foliage as well, similar. He's working with a similar rake, large uh, wooden rake with pines on it. And if you enlarge this, and if you were reporting centuries, he's also raking a lot of little round red things. He's harvesting coffee in Hawaii. Now, if you were to use various tools in your tool belt and you were needing to describe a location, Massachusetts and Hawaii are very different. Here's some cute folks. Panda parent and I assume, assumption on my part, that's bad, and baby. Looking really cute, sitting amongst the eucalyptus, probably having a little snack or lunch. Don't know that for sure, but they do like to eat eucalyptus. And I know that eucalyptus plants are not native to Ohio. It does look like they're growing. They're, they could be transplanted here and in a habitat. But say, let's just say that they are in their native habitat. So let's say they're in China or Mongolia or east, very, very east of where I'm sitting. Now we've got this critter. He's also black and white and has a nice soft coat. I haven't petted one, but it looks really soft. And he's got all kind of little spiky things around him as well. 
This is a West Appalachia skunk. And when you look at this photo, you have to think what sensories would you maybe use if you were to cue yourself or give yourself a move command to mentally do what at this target that might help you broaden your um, reporting ability, which again would help with learning about the location. And then here are the references. So that means we're finished with this. And I have much of the same here in a Word program, but there's that way I just thought I could send it if anybody wanted it. I don't think I tweaked it much. Most of the content is the same. But Lynn, um, I have just a bunch of pictures now all over the globe, and I didn't know if it would help you to have something to look at. Um, when, if you could just include in whatever you had to say, what would you be looking for in a professional session, which everybody's training toward, to describe this location and topology? Okay. Uh, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sure. You're great. Uh, you had said earlier, might the analyst or somebody be looking for something specific? They're always looking for something specific. You never yes, know I'm what. Le I'm leading you. Yes, I am. And so, uh, as an analyst, what would I be looking for is different from if I were viewing. Right. What would I be looking for in this? Okay. Right. If you were reporting this as Lindy Cannon, mm -hmm. as either a viewer or an analyst, what would you be looking for that would be distinctive to this location? Because some of these folks okay. just might say, Snowy Mountains, okay, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. And uh, I've got a little thing prepared, so let me just start on mine rather than answering questions right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, remote viewing has um, some things that seem to contradict each other, but we have tools that make them not contradict each other. One is like a picture like this. Your job as a remote viewer is to completely describe everything in this picture, everything around this picture, everything that's not in the picture, and all that. And so you're supposed to describe everything. <clears throat> Obviously, you're not going to be able to do that. Another thing that seems to contradict that is that your subconscious mind has to stay in charge. And so in a session, when you're doing a session, you can't stop and ask yourself a question because that puts your conscious mind in charge of the session. So as a remote viewer, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> you, you, uh, you aren't getting something. You, you know, you've described, okay, it's cold and all that, <clears throat> or it's, it's mountainous and hilly. And then you get stuck. You're not supposed to stop and cue yourself. If you have a monitor, the monitor can pop in and say temperatures, smells, taste, textures, and all that. And that kicks your subconscious mind into perceiving things. Uh, leave the picture up if you would. Okay. I was going to put those cues up next to it. Do you want me to do that? Uh, no. Yeah, you can. Uh huh. Okay. I'm getting there. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> um, there we go. Anyway, yeah. in the military, we had we had it actually pretty good as remote viewers because the military has one thing in abundance, and that is people. And uh, you know, we were able to have. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were able to have monitors with our sessions who could always sit there and as soon as we stalled or had a hard time, they would say luminance, taste, textures, smells, you know, and so on. And so they would do our conscious mind thinking for us, which is actually the ideal situation in a remote viewing session. The uh, remote viewer works on the subconscious level. The monitor pops in any time any conscious stuff is needed. The problem is nowadays, 
that most of y'all are working without monitors. You don't have monitors. Um, it's great if you can have a buddy system, you know, with some other viewers. Um, but generally in your practice sessions, you don't have monitors. So <clears throat> um, in a session, you can uh, have this list that uh, Teresa is providing you and have it sitting over to the side where you're not looking at it, you're not working with it and all that during a uh, session. And then whenever you stall and you're not getting anything, glance over to that real quick and and you look over very quickly and it says and your eye catches textures. Ah. Now then you go back into viewing and you've had that one little flash of a cue, but you're still working with the subconscious. And you say, oh textures, well powdery, uh rough, uh there's furry feel, there's um uh, scratchy feel and, and all this and uh, and so on. And then you go ahead and describe everything that you can get that way. And then you say, oh, well, I'm not getting anything else. As quickly as possible, you glance over and you say, ambiance, ooh, oh, outdoors, it's big, it's open, it's wide, and so on. And so you can use this list that uh, Teresa is going to provide you as a surrogate monitor. That way you don't have to stop your session. You don't have to stop your viewing and say, let's see, what else could I go after? Oh yeah, I could go after, uh, what is the ambiance here? The minute you do that, you've taken yourself out of session, okay? <clears throat> now, this, this list, this queuing list, by the way, uh, she's got, the asterisk besides shapes and sizes, the asterisk should go down on each one of the ones below it to orientation, direction. Those are all dimensionals. So all the way down to mass. But, um, and you don't do those until you have actually come up without queuing or whatever with a dimensional of some kind. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> there's a, much better way to do this and a much more beneficial way to do it than having this this queuing list. For now, use that queuing list. It's a great list. It's a great surrogate monitor. Uh, the other way is there is a rule in remote viewing that says if the viewer cannot describe what's right in front of him or the room around him, then don't expect him to send his mind halfway around the world and describe anything accurately there. How many of you could, uh, could sit in a room and describe everything around you without turning around and looking? Uh, I had a class in Washington State one time and it was in a uh, VFW place and on the second day, late in the second day, we were talking about this. And um, I said, for example, how many of you in the class have seen the wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling American flag that's on the back wall of this room? And all of a sudden, about five people in the class snapped, turned around and looked, and they were surprised that <laughs> this American flag that went from wall to wall and floor to ceiling that they hadn't seen. They had just come into class, looked at their manuals and, and you know, listened to the to the talk and, and done their sessions and all that and had never seen a flag that big before in their life. And there it was right beside them all the time. Um, I have a, um, a little exercise that I do for people. I say, uh, uh, go in, take an empty ice cube tray, and uh, fill each ice cube hole one at a time with water so that you can put it in the freezer and, and make ice cubes. And they do, and they do it one at a time and so on. 
I put it in the fridge, and then I turn to him and I say, fine, how many ice cubes, how many ice cube holes are in that tray? And they always say, oh, I don't know, I wasn't counting. Well, on a conscious level, you don't know. On the subconscious, you know exactly how many there were. And so I'll say, okay, was it two rows of two, so there are only four cubes? Oh, no, it was more than that. Okay, two rows of three, so there are only six cubes. Oh, no, more than that. And pretty soon, without any asking of a question, they'll say, oh, I know, there were 18. And I'm mean, I'm 16, which is standard ice cube tray in the US. Um, and they'll be right. And, uh, and because all of a sudden they realize that consciously they don't know, and so they access their subconscious mind and they get a mental picture of the ice cube tray and they say, oh, there were 16, you know, eight to a side. So anyway, uh, the information is there. And if you can do this in real life by simply looking around you and describing things, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to become aware of things around you in your normal life. You'll be seeing things that the other people in the room won't see. You'll be catching things that nobody else will catch. You'll be listening to a conversation and you'll catch little innuendos that nobody has seen before you catch inflections on people's faces and all that and you just simply take a picture like this and you sit there and do that p2 exercise and you say okay <clears throat> what do i see in this picture now y'all have been looking at this picture right which one of you would like to volunteer for a little experiment right now <laughs> Anybody? Okay, Michael. Can you put Michael on uh, mic? Can um, you get... Hang on. He just told me that I'm not sure he's functional here tonight. Just a minute. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, Michael, I don't think your... Let me scroll up. I don't think your system is working. Well, we're waiting for a volunteer here. Oops, let me tell you that um, English is based on nouns. What most of us do is we will view until we find a noun and we'll say, oh, it's hilly, it's sloping, it's, um, it's tall, it's big, oh, it's a mountain, and then we stop. Well, okay, so it's a mountain. But then you go to something else. Oh, I see flat ground, too. Okay. No, describe the mountain. Tell me about it. But how can you do that without cueing yourself? And the way is that you become sensitive in real life. And if you can describe this mountain in real life to the greatest detail, then you will become so sensitive to the things around you that when your mind gets it, to a site halfway around the world, it will be sensitive to them there. And you won't have any trouble picking up on information and you won't have to ask yourself a question. Uh, okay, uh, Patrick, can you give Patrick a mic? Yeah. Okay, Patrick, Patrick. describe this without using nouns, okay, and just describe this picture. Give us descriptors of it. Okay. Um, it's very ice cut. Um, if you look at those, uh, the classic name for them is ridge line. Okay. Uh, can you back away from the micro a little bit? You're really hard to understand. It's over modulating. Is that better? Uh, now then, maybe a little bit closer. <laughs> Can't hear you now. How's that? Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead and, and give it a go. Okay. Give it a go, yeah. Well, I guess if I was doing feelings, then obviously the 
Just describe everything in the picture. Okay. Um, vegetation, lichen, moss. Okay, um, now vegetation is a noun, okay? Okay, then. Okay, but you said vegetation, okay. There's all kinds of vegetation. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. But um, one thing that would differentiate that would be it's very low lying vegetation, it's very low down. Um, absence of trees, something that isn't there. Um, so I'd be describing moss, I'd be describing uh, small vegetation, I mean, cut size, or something to say that something preventing. It's not plant friendly. Again, I'm saying what isn't there rather than what is there. But it gives, if something's not there that people expect. Uh, don't, don't consciously think it through, okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, now then, you've described the vegetation, right? I have this, I haven't. I have yeah. given a small indicator, but uh, in terms of color. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, let's try for greens, let's try for browns, let's try for very dark. Would be an overall description for it. So, not light colored, not purple. Not very green, not very uh, healthy in terms of being overgrown, in terms of being successful in its environment. It's a very harsh place. Uh, something else is there, obviously, is, is the height. Um, the big differential between the tallest point and the lowest point. So, in terms of um, topography, topology, then it would be um, very disparate in terms of height, very varying. I pass very much jagged, good description for it. Okay, let's just for brevity here, let's say that. You've come to that description and you say, uh, I can't think of anything more. Of course you can. But let's um, say you can't think of anything more. So you take the list you've made and you hand it to somebody and you say, tell me something about this vegetation or whatever that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a really hard time understanding you. Uh, tell me about this vegetation that I didn't get. And they look at the tree and they say, oh, how about scrawny and thin and, you know, barren? And you think, oh, well, I didn't say that. You know, or how about interspersed with snow? Okay. And somebody else will come up with some description that you didn't get. Well, next time you're going to be more sensitive to that. Okay. And next time, you're going to be looking for that. You keep doing this with real-world pictures. I mean, just take a picture out of a magazine and describe everything about it. Hand it to somebody and say, tell me what I missed. They'll find something. They always will. And every time they do, you'll become more and more sensitive to exactly that. Okay? Um, and this is... Um, this is what this exercise is all about, is making you sensitive to the things around you. Um, are we going to another picture here? You betcha. Okay, good. I've got a bunch of them. Good deal. Would somebody else like to try this one? I will. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay. Um, Irregular, jagged, scaly, gray, lumpy, ribbon-like, patterned, um, rope-like, uh, hard if I knock on it with my knuckles, 
hot, orange, red, glowing, um, tall, and taller in some spots, slanting, sloped, bumpy, gray, black, cracked, uh, watery, um, ocean-like, salty, rippled edge, wavy, bumpy, vast, uh, cloud-like, fluffy, lighter Anchor. gray, silvery. Yeah, let's, let's say you stop there and you say, oh, I can't find anything else, okay? okay. Uh, and, of course, you can, you know. But uh, just for brevity here, and you hand that to somebody and you they say, oh, well, you didn't say outdoors, <laughs> right? And you didn't say wavy, you know, and uh, and and so on. And so um, you didn't say built up over time and all this. And, uh, you know, and they will find things. Well, the next time you're going to be sensitive to whether something's indoors or outdoors and whether the water is calm or wavy or smooth and so on. And um, what this does when you do this in real life, either with the room around you or with pictures out of magazines or whatever, it gets you more and more attentive to those things around you. And like I say, in real life, it lets you perceive things that the other people around you in the same room aren't perceiving. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, and as such, you wind up being the one who catches things where nobody else does. You wind up being the one who knows things that other people don't realize. Plus, because you have become sensitive to these things, you get into a session and without cueing, you will start seeing these things at the target. And so um, the rule is, it's an, it's an analyst rule that if a viewer can't describe the room around them, don't expect them to be able to describe a distant target. Okay. And so this exercise uh, is um, a way of making you more and more sensitive to what's around you. Um, you can have this separate page that you can use during session. And uh, if you do this exercise outside of sessions, it will make you extremely sensitive. It will do something else, too. Uh, let's look at this peat bog here, okay? What color is that peat? Brownish green. Brownish green. It's also black. It's also orange. You can see it up there among the trees. It's also um, what ten different shades of green, and uh, there's some there's some bright green over there to the side. And uh, uh, I had a uh, fantastic artist in a class I had. And uh, we were doing this exercise, and I said, okay, everybody in the class, I said, describe that wall. And it was just wall of the training room. And um, the official color of the paint on the wall is desert sand. It's a light beige white. And um, one person said it's beige. Another one said it's white. Another one says, well, it's off-white. And we got around to the artist, and he looked, and he said, there's a thousand colors on that wall. He said, there's the wall itself. There's the wall, the light that's coming off of the pool, making part of it bluish. There's a part that's coming off of the center courtyard, making it greenish. There's a part. We have uh, uh, red adobe tile floors, and he said, if you look at the bottom of the wall, there's the red light reflected from that, and he said, not only that, but there's the green hitting the red, which is reflecting a, a, a muted color over to the side, and he could actually name 
<laughs> all of those colors. And um, doing this exercise will also increase your vocabulary. And it's not a remote viewing rule. It's a real rule uh, that uh, the words that you are capable of using describe the limit of your ability to think. So as you increase your vocabulary, you increase your ability to think. And so doing this exercise will also help you in that in that manner too. Um, um, and, I chose a peat bog because it might have some distinctive features. You want yeah. to touch on that possibly? You betcha. Now then, we're talking about terrains tonight, right? We're <laughs> we trying finally, to. We finally get around to terrains. Okay. Um, when uh, most most viewers, especially beginning viewers, will uh, come to a noun, and that's where they quit describing that. They say, "Oh, okay, it's it's flat, it's land, it's flat, and uh, it's grassy," and then they move on to something else. Okay, they may get land which is a noun they may get one or two descriptors but then they move on because in their mind they're satisfied that it's land uh one of the uh targets that we have for a really really advanced viewers is a uh, bus parking lot uh, it's a picture of a bus parking lot and um each of the buses in this parking lot, uh, it's a school bus parking lot, and it's for like 20 different schools around a, a huge metropolitan area. And so each of these, uh, each of these buses is slightly different. And they say, okay, uh, there are a lot of things here. Oh, they're man-made, they're mechanical. And somebody might say, okay, uh, these are big, square, long, hold a lot of people. I think it's a bus. And we say, fine. We give them actual in-session in feedback, and we say, you're absolutely right. The target is a bus. And by that time, they will have said, there are lots of them. We say, okay, one of those buses is our target. Describe it so well that we can pick it out from all the other buses here. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, the things that Teresa started out with, I could I could just imagine some of y'all saying, we're supposed to do that. With this training and with these exercises, you can do that. Okay. And it makes it get very easy for you to describe this. Like you say on this, this is land, this is flat, it's watery. And you move on, okay? Don't move on. Can you describe this land so well that I could tell that this is not a swamp or that I could tell that this is not a rice paddy, okay? And can you describe it that well? And if you start learning to be sensitive to the things that are there, you you start saying, okay, this is land. Now, you know, a move command, let's say there's one where the mountain's in the distance, like that first one, and uh, the monitor would say, okay, move to, you know, move five miles to the, to the front, okay? And that's going to put you up on top of the mountain. Okay. Before you move that five miles, you can actually look and say, oh, I'm going to be going up. All right. Um, also, if you notice, ambiance is one of the um, cues over here. Uh, I would imagine that at some time, all of you have been up on a high altitude of some kind and down at a low altitude of some kind, and you know that there's a different feeling. The air is different. The the whole ambiance is different. And, uh, okay, the monitor says, move five miles to the north and describe. 
you immediately, your subconscious immediately jumps five miles to the north, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to describe this land. Oh, I feel like I'm up in the mountains somewhere, or I feel like this is a high altitude because you're sensitive to your own feeling of ambiance or colors or luminance or whatever. You say, oh, this is brighter. It's brighter here than it was somewhere else. Somebody says, um, uh, move 25 feet to the right. Oh, I'm indoors now because you pick up on the indoors feeling. And so um, you you have to become sensitive to all of these things or else you're not going to get them in a remote viewing session. The way to become sensitive to them is through using a list like this to train yourself in session to become sensitive to them or by having a monitor or by doing this exercise here where you just grab a picture out of a magazine and start describing everything in it, okay? And there's more I had to say, but right at this point, I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions about what I've said so far. Um, let me scroll down here. I've noticed learning another language makes you think in a different way. Absolutely. And it also makes you think in nuances. You know, they always say things don't translate well, and that's because one language has a nuance that others, and in a remote viewing session, if you speak multiple languages, what you'll find is that you'll come to a descriptor, <clears throat> and all of a sudden a word from another language pops in, because it's telling you that the language of English, let's say, does not have the specific word for that but there's a slight nuance, okay? And so uh, the word from the other language comes in. And that's perfectly good. Uh, and if you're if you're an analyst, if you're doing actual work, you know, uh, operational work, and your analyst doesn't understand that, that foreign word, then it's the analyst's job to look it up. <laughs> it's not your job. Uh, you can explain it to them, but it's not your job. It's the analyst's job to look it up. But if something comes in to you in a second language, write it down in that second language, okay? Because that's telling you, your subconscious is telling you, there's a small nuance here that is um, that is important, okay? Uh you have as many souls as tongues you speak Tibetan, Kashmir, proverb, okay. Um, an attempt description from the list, okay. Um, he, that was when you asked him before. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so here is another picture in uh, South America this time. A few things that you know would be clues about that. You know, yeah, there actually there are a lot of people with alpacas here in Ohio now. Yeah. But um, anyway, the topology here is you know somewhat different than what we've seen. There's no snow on these mountains, and it's rough, and and uh, some of the other terrain has been rough. But this is dry versus wet. There's no snow. It's brown versus white. Um, it has some scrubby looking uh, foliage. Um, you know, there's the relationship of the alpaca. So you have several. So you have the ability to practice relationships, bigger, smaller, counting, male, female. You know, uh, I don't know what else would we, would we want to talk about. Not only that, but if you come up with, let's say, man made land, which is the road here. Yeah. The road is paved. The road is also rising and curving. It's not straight. Okay. Right. It's lined with green on one side, but not on the other. It's uh, 
partway up a hill or partway down a hill. And uh, this is a fantastic practice picture for this. I mean, this is perfect because it um, it has the far mountains, the flat valley below it. It has the hills. It has the paved area and the rough area. And one thing you may notice is that, see where the alpacas are headed? Look at that rock outcropping there. See how under the slanted sunlight it looks purple? Now, you may not think by looking at this picture that that, that matters. But that would tell an archaeologist, I mean, a uh, geologist. Oh, sorry. Oh, gosh. It's okay. That would tell the geologist that there's manganese here. You could uh, you could also move to the land, pick up a handful, and describe. Okay, uh, you could describe the uh, the vegetation that's there. It's sparse. You have a computer what, problems. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is zoom in on that photo. It keeps sending me back up to the first one. I know. Why don't you just leave it full size there? And All right. I mean, normal size. Yeah, I was going to zoom in so they could see the manganese. Yeah, well, you see that purple rock over to the right side. Yeah, I know. And uh, uh, you could get the texture. You could get the angle. Boy, your computer is... No, I'll give up. I had it at least a little bit bigger. Let me right. let me get yeah. it back to 120, and then I'll go back okay. to that photo, and I won't touch it again. All right. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, pictures like that, you can describe this until you're just blue in the face, and you hand it to somebody else, and they will say, oh, you didn't say that. They're all facing the same way. Oh yeah, uh, you know, and uh, and you know, uh, you didn't say that uh, uh, that the flatland is green, okay? You didn't say that there's haze that's bluish, okay? Uh, you didn't say that there's a a uh, flat square <clears throat> over between this mountain and the one to the right, a flat shiny square area, okay? And, uh, and so they will find things that you didn't see even though you were looking straight at it and studying the picture. And what happens is the next picture you study, you're going to be more sensitive to these things. Rice paddy, oh yeah. This is a good picture too. Uh, I had a good teacher. This is uh, um, actually a target and, uh, you know, a remote viewing target. And I don't know how many people will get the uh, the water, the land and all that and stair steps and even draw the stair step. And they'll say, um, there's a building or something like that, and uh, not describe the roof, not describe the fact that the building has no walls, and uh, um, and miss things like that. Uh, but uh, you know that's that's understandable. But if you do this thing, this practice like this, not just with pictures in magazines, but shoot the room around you. Uh, you're driving along. You're driving to work in the morning. Look over somewhere along the way. Look over at a building. Look away from it. And in your mind, totally describe that building. The next morning, when you're driving by it, see if you got anything right. See if you missed anything and so on. And... Um, what you're trying to do is make yourself more sensitive to your surroundings. If you can if you can describe the room around you, then I'll trust you to send your mind halfway around the world and describe a room there. 
Go ahead. We have a, a question from Michael. Um, oh. uh, Linda asked one a couple of minutes ago too. Um, said we're doing a great job. She really appreciates it. Uh, finds it very inspiring, and she's wondering why on the Denali photo we didn't get into immensity, openness, sharpness, the peaks, or sponginess, life form, scimitar shape, like the horns. Yeah, I think Patrick is going to get into the into things like that, but I kind of cut him off short just for brevity. Yeah, yeah. and I said we're just getting warmed up. Yeah. And uh -huh. then, uh, yeah. and thank you for. Uh, it's nice to know we're uh, inspiring. Um, Michael is asking, which should you work on first in a session, the overall ambiance and descriptions of a target that move to specific aspects like the bios, or basically from the wide view to the details or from the details out? So do you have any thoughts on that? Or because oh, we don't want to do a template, you know, but. Absolutely, I do. <laughs> okay. So, um, your subconscious knows not only what's important about a target, but what's important about the tasking of the target. When you pop into a session, which is generally at the point of the AI, what you start noticing first is what you should put first. Okay? What hits you the biggest? That's what you, that's where you start. Um, and so you say, oh, it's in front of me. You write the AI, it's in front of me. You write down the emotion that that gives you. Oh, that's a surprise. You dump the emotion, but you keep the building or you keep whatever it is in front of you. And then you say the thing in front of me is, and you start giving details about it. Then when you run out of those, you look around. This is the big secret that's not really a secret about remote viewing is that when you have that AI, you have put yourself at the target. You don't really have to have to get rules and regulations after that. Just look around you and just start describing what you get. When you get into stage four, there is a matrix <clears throat> where you put, okay, in front of me in the dimensional column, and then you go describing what's in front of you, okay? Then you say, oh, over to the right, there's something red. So you move to the red, and you describe what's in the red and all that. So in stage four, you will start zeroing in on something, describing it completely, moving, describing something else completely, and so on. Um, in stage two and three, you're just hitting everything at random. It's called winking about the site. But when you get into stage four, um, that's when we can answer this question that Michael asked. What you should should you work on first? Once you get into stage four, whatever hits you the hardest, okay? And then you will start picking up things around that and you go to each one, describe it, describe it, describe it. Um, uh, doing a thorough mapping and description of a computer circuit board. Uh, one of those chips may be the main chip that the customer wants and you describe that chip, but then you have to tell how that chip is hooked up. And so then you spread out to the other chips you describe each one, oh, this one's square. No, this other one is long and thin and so on. And um, and so the the main answer is whatever hits you first, that's what you go with first. Uh, I hope that helped. Uh, move to specific aspects like the bios, okay, alpacas and so on. Um, yeah, let's say... Um, Let's say on that uh, that one with the alpacas, somebody wants to know where a missing person is, okay? And you get there, there are mountains everywhere in the world, there are valleys everywhere in the world, there are roads everywhere in the world, but what's going to probably hit you first about that one is the alpacas because you cut it down and that sort of narrows out the the, you know, North Pole, the South Pole, and uh, places like that, the middle of the ocean or whatever out on the ship. 
and um, that those alpacas may stand out because those are the detail that will answer the tasker's question, and so they'll pop out at you first. So you say, there's a bio. Oh, okay, describe the bio. Now, to tell them, to tell the tasker there's a biological here, how's he going to know that it's four-legged, it's very long-necked, okay? And now you've described a giraffe, okay? It has a curled tail. You're still, you know, a giraffe. Very soft fur. Uh, giraffes don't have soft fur, I don't think. And, um, you know, it's small and so on. And so then you start giving the descriptors. And in the descriptors, the information will come out to the analyst saying, okay, this is not Africa. This is not, you know, this is not downtown New York City. This is whatever. And um, so, yeah, you go with what comes out first, and then you work down on the details, and you do that in stage four. Like I say, in stage one, two, and three, you're hitting everything at random. So you have no choice as to what, gonna, what you're going to do or the way you're going to work it. It's just whatever hits you, you write it down and keep moving. I tell my students that when you get the phase four matrix, it's like now all of a sudden you have the entire stage. If oh, you yeah. were like in a play, you now have the entire stage to uh, move about, and it, you and it's not that you're not in control with the first three phases, but in phase because um, you can while you're learning, you can still chase details oh, when yeah. you're in the first three stages. But um, once you get to stage four, I think you, you're really into whatever you want to explore. You know? That's right, yeah. And whatever you get curious about, you know, you say, oh, yeah. there's something red over there, and you can just blow it off. But you say, oh, there's something green over on this other side. I wonder what that is. And you'll go describe it, okay? Um, yeah, if you all haven't had intermediate training to get stage four, uh, I always tell my students that stage four is like opening the gates and letting the horses run free because all of a sudden you are free in that session and you can just, like like Teresa said, you can view the entire stage, you can view everything there. Now here's you, another you, farmer. You can go open the gate and let the horse radishes run free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so here we have, there was that one little red dot in the right patty was a biological. I'll mm -hmm. call him a farmer. And here's another farm uh, farmland. It looks a lot different than the last farmland, which totally was different. wet. Yep. And so how would you go about describing this land? Okay, what most people are going to come up with is there's land, it's flat, it's sandy, it's malleable, it's not hard, okay? It's, uh, um, there, there's green here, okay? Describe the green. Oh, well, the green is in rows. Look at that. And the green is big leaf, okay? Uh, when people normally describe that there's grass at a site, they don't describe the grass. Uh, that first, not the first picture, but uh, uh, the one with the koala bears. Yeah. Did you notice that there are two different types of grass in that picture? Uh, I was mostly just for the talk focusing on the eucalyptus. Yeah, well, I don't think that's eucalyptus. Uh, well, there are actually three different types. Eucalyptus is a tree. Those may be baby trees, I'm not sure. I can cheat. The picture said eucalyptus, too. Oh, okay. Those are baby trees, then. <laughs> and uh, by the way, if you've never smelled a eucalyptus tree, they smell great. <laughs> and, and I mean, you get you get within 30 feet of a eucalyptus tree, you know you're 
if you know the smell, you know that there's eucalyptus tree around. Uh, but things like this, okay? Describe the green. Oh, it's leafy. It's the leaves are going out from a central point, okay? Uh, everything's in rows and so on. And um, and you can start describing. Also, uh, you can see that somewhere over there, it turns into a different type of crop. Looks like trees in the distance. There's a house on the right side and a house on the left side of the picture. There's something there right to the right of the center of the picture that's a, evidently a man-made. I'm not sure. I'm guessing a vehicle, but. Anyway. Yeah, that's what I would think. Maybe. And we're going to have some chopping motion because these guys all have hoes and they have implements. Yeah, uh-huh. And the fact that they have implements and they're chopping the ground, you say, well, that's not the terrain. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You're not going to stand there with a hoe and chop on rock, you know. And you might stand there with an axe and chop on rock if you're gem hunting. But uh, generally in gem hunting, you're not working on flat ground, you know, whatever. And, okay, something, there's a biological there, chopping with a tool. Describe the tool, okay? Describe the motion. Describe the, how the person is dressed. Because how the person is dressed does tell you something about the topology. It does tell you something about the land. If this were the uh, if this were a glacier, he wouldn't be there in the cut off t shirt, you know, in cut offs and t shirt. And um, and so all of these things, when you say describe the land, uh, all of these things will fit in as they apply to the land. And you're talking about terrain. Don't just say there's land; it's flat, and then move on to something else. Uh, okay, um, a monitor can move you just about anywhere in, once in the session. I've heard this is helpful and for getting around difficult events or targets. Right? Um, is there any way to do this when you're on your own? When you are your own monitor? Yeah, this is one of the uh, problems. I have that um, virtual monitor that you can put on a computer, and it will give you move commands and it will give you the cues just like a monitor would. The problem is that uh, Microsoft keeps changing their operating system and making outmoded, you know, making the old software so it doesn't work. Um, the thing doesn't work in Windows 7. I seriously doubt it works in Windows 8 and uh, I just haven't reprogrammed it. Knowing that when I get it working for Windows 8, they'll come out with Windows, oops, we're sorry. And, uh, you know, uh, Sahara Desert, look at this. <clears throat> Describing the Sahara Desert. You would think there were no trees in the Sahara Desert. You'd be wrong. <laughs> there are date trees out there. And, uh, there's actually a lot of vegetation. You go out to white sand down here by my home, and you would think because this is desert and because those are sand dunes that there's no vegetation, but there's vegetation all over the place. And uh, and you would think there are no animals living out there. Well, there are animals out there, white foxes, white toads, uh, white... Uh, Worms, white beetles, <laughs> and uh, white lizards, and things that you can look straight at standing there and not see them because they're all white against the white background. But uh, but they're there. And so, anybody want to take a stab at 
this looks like a very simple picture. Anybody want to take a stab at it, at describing it? And Terry, we'll get to your question in just a minute. Yeah. Oh, uh, Terry, uh, in what phase do move commands take place? They can take place in any phase except phase five and phase one. However, after a move command, you may be asked to do a phase five or a phase one uh, to get descriptors of the new place. But when you're in phase five or in phase one, the monitor cannot give you a move command. Are we confused yet? <laughs> um, and when you do give yourself a move command, You've moved away from the target, so you need to, um, a lot of folks will write at the top of every page, move to the assign, assign target and describe. And you need yeah. to do that after you've given yourself a move command if you've moved away from the target. Yeah. You need to return to the target. Um, also, you know, there's something to be said for in basic, um, you know, you're really, you're learning a lot of stuff, but you're also, I think, crippled by structure because, frankly, a lot of people are coming in now, they already have some knowledge of remote viewing, and their subconsciouses are rare to go. And they're getting all kinds of advanced information, conceptual and stuff, and learning structure. And so they're trying to get it all down and, and, and learn it. Um, and yes, you can give yourself move commands, but I'm trying to teach my folks that you know, you're trying really hard to get to that AI and get to phase three so you can start sketching. So it's not that I don't want you to hang out in phase two and move around and stuff, because that's all you can do when you're limited and basic. But um, I just wanted to throw that in there once you have like phase four matrix to work in and stuff. Um, I usually don't encourage people to move around a lot really early, but. You know, like I, I said, when that's all you have to work with, yeah. then, you know, you're exploring. Yeah, I try to kind of discourage it myself. Me uh, too. The thing is, that target's going to be there five minutes later when you're in the higher stage anyway. You don't have to yeah. you don't have to get the target, you know, on the first line of the first page. And, in fact, one of the big mistakes that beginning viewers make is they try to get the target instead of, describing the target. Um, if somebody's giving you a target, they already know what it is. And when you get into operations, which is what you're training for, they give you a target, they already know what the target is. What they don't know is some of the descriptors about it or something like that. And so they're after details. They're not after you to identify what it is. Um, we had a general come in, and he had a picture, a satellite picture of a building in a foreign country. And uh, um, one of the viewers did a like a one-hour session and came back and told him the target is a building. <laughs> and we never saw that general again, you know. <laughs> The general wanted a full description of the building, but he wanted a full description of what's inside the building. And uh, and so he wanted descriptors. He didn't want an identification. He already knew it was a building. And the police tell you, you know, there's a criminal. And uh, describe the criminal. And you come back and you say, oh, it's biological. <laughs> well, duh, you know. Um, Everybody wants descriptors. They don't want identification. So you don't identify, you describe. Um, and like I say, most people will come up with a noun. They'll say land or plant or something like that. They'll give one or two descriptors and move on. When you should stay and describe it as well as you can. Neat picture. <clears throat> yeah, um, I thought the, I just thought I'd put that up there for Daniel, just so he'd have it in writing yeah. um, about move commands. Um, and Daniel, I'm sorry, who did you, I think you trained with somebody 
if you could clarify that for me. Um, and yes, uh, as far as different deserts and different terrains, I thought that I would throw up there the uh, Sahara and then the Baja because they're obviously two different parts of the world. You're getting two different types of biologicals or more than two. But, um, you know, you have the more palm tree type, then you have the succulent cacti here, uh, the scrubby stuff versus the more lush. The Sahara actually looks more lush than the scrubby stuff to me, but. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the Sahara produces fruit. This doesn't. And by mm -hmm. the way, see those uh, bushy things there? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I'll tell you from personal experience. Mm hmm those are not bushy feeling. <laughs> uh -huh. Those are also cactus. Uh -huh. and they are worse on you than those tall cactus are if you run up against them. Uh, yeah. Those bushes, I mean, they are wicked. They will just tear you up. Now, the grass around it, of course, is generally dry, but it's soft. So anyway, there are two different types of desert and topology here for your viewing pleasure. And just because I thought that Africa was being a little neglected, <laughs> I thought I would, uh, this is always a good one. Everybody always likes Victoria Falls. But um, this would be an interesting topographical to describe? Um, when it comes to describing terrain and describing land, you will often find in police work that rather than describing a criminal or a crime or a person or something like that, they want to know about the land. Uh, okay. We did a... Uh, I'm sorry? The location. The location, yeah. They want to know the location where a missing person is. Or uh, one thing that we did, oh, shoot, 10 years ago now, uh, we had the uh, police from a border city between the U.S. and, the, and Mexico uh, come by, and they said, uh, we're getting kind of radio traffic, you know, there's going to be a humongous amount of uh, of drugs uh, moved pretty soon. And they said, we want to know exactly where and when. And we did the timeline to find out when, but uh, we got a map and did a um, CRV dowsing to find out the general location. But then they wanted to know exactly where on that map. And so that required a full description of the exact area where the drugs were going to come across the border. We gave that and gave the time. And uh, that police department had uh, DEA agents and local police agents hiding in the bushes. And sure enough, right at that specific time, right at that exact place, that we had described. We didn't know where it was. We just knew a general area on the map. But from our description, they knew exactly where along that area the uh, the place was. They had the people there. The drugs came across the border. They got every bit of them. They got all the people that were running them and, and all that. And so um, it was... You know, it was not only the general description and the timeline and all that, but it was the exact detailed, highly detailed description of the exact area that actually let them make the drug bust. Uh, for a predominant feature or prominent feature, um, for instance, we just had a an informal type project I just ran. It's called Project Publish. And one of the targets was the Grand Hotel, Mackinac Hotel, Mackinac Island. And one of the viewers 
was kind of disappointed in themselves because they were viewing and describing something that looked very much like the Mackinac Bridge. Although there, the deck, the, the picture showed the deck along the front of the Mackinac Island Resort Hotel, and it had a lot of crisscrosses and stuff too, but the descriptors and stuff that were coming in lent themselves toward the bridge. And I haven't gone over these sessions, but just to skim them. And uh, I was explaining to the viewer, I said, don't beat yourself up just because that bridge was five miles away. If you were standing on the deck, uh, the promenade of that Grand Resort Hotel, that's going to be a huge feature that you're going to be staring at. And so if it got your attention and what you just said, Lynn, if this were an operational target and that is a location feature, that if a customer for some reason had three or four locations to choose from and there is a predominant feature that they can look at with certainty and go, well, the other five don't have this one, but this one does. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a very important thing. So the subconscious will often choose, as you were trying to explain or were explaining, sorry, um, that even though we didn't think it was important, it's a very important thing to that location. That's right. Um, there was a um, target one time. Uh, Paul Smith did it. It was a uh, political hostage over in uh, Lebanon. And uh, uh, Paul had accessed the uh, political hostage, had reported on that person's health, um, their emotional state and everything else, and was then told to describe the building. And so instead of going outside and moving outside and describing the building, what he did was he described what the uh, person could see in the room they were in. He had them look out the window, and he came up with the word Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, uh, the analyst right there in uh, at Fort Meade just blew that off. But they had learned by then, report everything. And so uh, the analyst over in Lebanon said, Hawaii, that's Lebanese for an antenna. And there is a huge antenna in one city and uh, – uh, when he said, when Paul had said Hawaii, he had told the angle of the sun, okay, uh, shining on, on buildings and all. And so they knew from the angle of the sun and, uh, the, uh, uh, the word Hawaii, which is a local name for an antenna in a certain city, they knew exactly where the hostage was. And, uh, um, I I think that they had a successful rescue on that hostage. But uh, here's another thing of, you know, a word coming in in a foreign language. And, um, and also the fact that simply by describing what he saw at the window and the angle of the sunlight on it, they were able to locate the uh, political hostage. So it's these these details are very very important. They really are. Boy, how would you like to go swimming there? Uh, it's just St. Patty's Day. No biggie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know why. Uh, there are plenty of cities that are highly urbanized, but I hadn't thrown any urban pictures in here, and I thought, well, let's throw in a city with a river cutting right up through it. So. Yeah. I, I thought that this was fairly distinctive, and it's not just, the only city with a river going through it, but... Right. How would you describe the land? Manufactured. Yeah. Um, covered with man-mades, yeah. And then, of course, you'd have to go describe the man-mades. Mm -hmm. Heavily populated. Yeah. Many biologicals. And then, I mean, here would be a good one if you needed to practice densities, you know, if you, uh, oh, yeah. And you've got all sorts of, uh, various options for sketching and patterns. 
and what time of year is this? What? What time of the year is this? St. Patrick's Day. I know. March. In March. March. So it's chilly. What if you didn't have? What if you didn't know it was St. Patrick's Day? See the tree. Oh, uh huh. No leaves. Right. Okay. There are all yeah. kinds of clues in this picture that if, even if you didn't have the thing, mm -hmm. uh, you could still tell an awful lot about this uh, this location. And it's almost 10 o'clock. Um, I only have just a very, maybe two or three more. Um, I, I like this one. Oh, this is a great target, by the way. And so how would you describe this if you were to describe the land? And, uh, uh, and for, for everyone here, Get uh, National Geographic or get some magazines, you know, uh, Texas Highways or, you know, what Arizona Highways or whatever, and um, just open it to any picture and sit there and describe and describe and describe. I mean, this is remote viewing with you having full feedback as you remote view. <laughs> and so you're actually. Uh, you're actually able to get, you would think you're actually able to get 100% accuracy on this picture. And everything you describe will be 100% accurate. But I guarantee you, you hand this to somebody else and they'll say, oh, you didn't say the soft vacuum was worse, you know. Or you didn't, you didn't say the sound of the waves. You didn't say the smell of the salt water, you know. And, uh, and those things are there. And when they bring those things up, it will make you more sensitive to smells, textures, taste, uh, ambiances, humidity in the air, and all kinds of things. And as you become more sensitive to the things around you, you will automatically become more sensitive to the things at the site. And that's the whole purpose of this exercise. When I look at that, I just think about old and how much work. Look at all that hard work. And, you know, what, I don't want to say the word poor. Um, I don't know, but I tell you what. What got me was there's no mortar in between those rocks. Yeah. And those rocks have been standing there for like four and five centuries. There's no mortar between them, and they've had all kinds of storms coming in and everything else, and there's no mortar. Yeah. Hard scrabble, that's the word that comes to my mind. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mongolia. Good school. I thought these guys were kind of cute. Yeah. <clears throat> It's a very unusual tent, by the way, for over there. Okay. It's not a yurt. Do they have yurts there? No. Yeah, they have yurts there, but that's not a yurt. That's a tent. Right. This is like a teepee. But yeah, it's probably a shelter for the uh, herdsmen. Yeah. It's not where anybody would live. Yeah. I don't that's think that the reindeer probably get to live in it. No. But look at the uh, the ground. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we have a saying out here in the desert. The best way to describe the area we live in is miles and miles of nothing but miles and miles. <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty accurate description. And here's our or low. There you go. Now you can talk about the uh, eucalyptus and the grass. Oh, and this isn't the one then. Uh, there was another picture that had grass all in front. Maybe it was the skunk. I don't know. But uh, there it is. Yeah. The two different types of grass. You've got over there uh -huh. on the right side a broadleaf grass. Right. Yeah. The rest of it is uh, is long spike leaf grass. Yeah. 
and that's the last one. I I could have kept going for hours. I thought, um, and it's ten o'clock, and we started late, so I guess yeah. it's not too bad. Yeah, I feel there's a lot of places that I didn't put in that I feel like I left them out. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's uh, so what happened. If you if you want to be a more accurate and a better remote viewer, this little exercise will. I mean, just drive you toward being a better remote viewer. Um, and that is you simply pull up a picture or you walk into your own living room. And you know those pictures on the wall that you have that have been there your your whole time and you haven't seen them in <laughs> in a year uh, because you take them for granted. Start becoming conscious of them. And um uh, as you train this with your conscious mind, your subconscious will become aware of everything around you. And if it becomes aware of everything around you, it'll change your life. But it'll also make you a much, much better viewer. And it's a very simple, very simple exercise. It's not hard. One of the, one of the things that is so hard to impress on students is you don't have to do a session to practice your remote viewing. You have two minutes. Do a couple of videograms. You have um, <clears throat> you have no minutes at all, but you're walking from one room to the other. Notice the change in ambiance. Notice the change in the lighting and the change in the smell. Notice the change in the feel and the temperature. You're doing your remote viewing. Okay? You're make you're doing your practice and uh, you're making yourself a better remote viewer because you're becoming sensitive to the things around you. And then we'll send your mind halfway around the world and you'll be sensitive to them there too. Okay. Um, I think we're going to need to wrap this up. Um, thanks everyone for coming and for asking your good questions. Hopefully that you found this helpful. Uh, next time we do one of our discussions, it will be in a month, the first, the second Wednesday <clears throat> in February. And we're going to be doing pretty much the same thing. And this tonight I grabbed terrain. And the next time we're going to talk about buildings. I just grabbed that out of uh, midair and we'll talk about how to describe a building. Because the, the sessions that I'm seeing, again, barely touch on any descriptors and I think that once you start thinking about how a building looks and what it's made of and how it feels and, and such, um I think we'll have another good discussion. So yeah. I hope so anyway. Um, Thank you, Lynn. Go is, ahead. This is no promise for anything very soon because uh it's gonna take me quite a while I'm afraid. But if I can get the um uh virtual monitor program to where it runs on uh windows 7 and 8 then i'll send a copy to uh teresa and you can uh you can just download them from her site oh thanks okay well and with that uh good night everybody and we'll see you in a couple of weeks and uh send me your sessions i'll get you read paths and there are a couple of you here that we need to get set up as far as manual review and get you rolling. So I will be emailing you soon, hopefully tonight, after I do bird inspection. <laughs> you sent that so, bird out into the cold. Yeah. Like cruel. I know. Well, actually, it's pretty ambient here today. We, it, we had a high of 22. Oh. Man. But I know. It, I honestly, when I went out to my car after work, it felt warm. You realize yeah. that's 40 degrees below my freezing point. <laughs> I know. Well, it was it was like 30 and 40 below here with the wind the last couple of days. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, good night, everybody, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night, and thank you for being here. You're welcome.